is on me now to introduce you to our panel. I'll introduce you to them in the order in which they'll be um, making their presentations tonight. And um, we have with us David Stockdale, who is Chief Executive of the British Tinnitus Association. We have Hazel Goodhart from um, Tinnitus Hub, where she's Director and Chief Strategist. Joining us through foul weather is Phil Gander. He's um, Associate Research Scientist at the University of Iowa, and he's a board member of the American Tinnitus Association. And finally, we have Ralph Holm, who is Executive Director of Research at the RNID. And thank you all um, for joining us tonight. Um, we've got a lot to get through, so I'm actually going to hand over now to um, David, who is going to start his presentation. Thank you very much, Nick. Hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, I guess that looks OK. Great. So I'm just going to um, go through a little bit in terms of what the British Tinnitus Association is doing to support research, some of our future plans, and then also just focus on a couple of recent papers that have been published as well. Um, the papers I'm going to refer to are free to access and uh, Maisie will put in links as well in the chat box in case any of you want to look at them later and, and um, find out a little bit more about them. Um, so is that? Yeah, marvellous. So starting um, with the beginning and our Marion Jack Shapiro Prize. So every year the BTA um, awards a prize to the piece of research with a UK author that's either most likely to lead to a cure or enhances our understanding of tinnitus. And the awards last year went to this paper that was led by um, Deb Hoare into the Quiet One trial. Um, so it was a trial uh, um, led by a biotech company um, called Ortiphany and Charles Large, who's named on this paper, is the MD of that company. And actually, it's really nice to see this paper win because it was a, a drugs trial. It really was a rigorous and well-defined and well-developed methodology. Sadly, the trial failed. But actually, it's, it's really enhanced our understanding of where tinnitus is at and what's needed to, to really help us push forward. And a lot of the, the findings and um, the output from this um, study informed a paper that um, I co-authored along with Ralph Holm, who's on this call, and also Charles Large, called Why is there no cure for tinnitus? Where we really tried to unpick what where we were up to and what was needed to really take tinnitus forward. So, so it's great to see this win and the learnings from this project are really critical to an enhance and, and, and um, enable our understanding to better design tinnitus trials in the future, but also understand what those real barriers are to, to pharma and, and biotechs getting involved in future tinnitus trials as well. Um, and so from that paper and from the paper I mentioned earlier, the why is there no cure for tinnitus, um, the BTA have developed our research priorities. So we have five of those. Um, one in, is to look at and identify tinnitus biomarkers. And the second is to look for objective measures of tinnitus. And neither of those may necessarily be helpful in um, clinical work, but would really help inform research. If we're able to develop a measure or a marker that tells if tinnitus is or isn't present, and ideally, if it changes and, and you can um, identify severity through that, then it will really help us in terms of looking at how to take research forward and not just rely on those subjective measures of tinnitus that, that most people with tinnitus will have filled out, those questionnaires that help assess tinnitus severity. Um, the third is to look at animal models and, and understand their relevance to human research. And again, that's really critical in terms of some of the drugs trials um, that paper that won the Marion Jack, Jack Shapiro Prize and um, did really well in terms of identifying a potential mechanism and a potential target for a drug in an animal model, but that then didn't translate into human work. So what's happening there? How do we better define and understand that? And do we need to humanize some of that preclinical work that typically happens in animals and, and look at how to do that better? Our fourth priority is to recognize that tinnitus is heterogeneous. So um, maybe we can't come up with subtypes, maybe we just have to recognise that actually it is this pervasive thing and there's lots of different ways that tinnitus may be um, there that may be resolved. So how do we manage that? How do we cater for that in trials? At the moment, 
the only real ways that tinnitus is is um, moderated within trials is to look at things like duration, um, sometimes severity, but actually, do we need better ways of looking at how to manage that heterogeneity in tinnitus research? And finally, can we identify subtypes of tinnitus? It's likely that there's more than, than one type of tinnitus. At the moment, you may be diagnosed further with either pulsatile or somatic tinnitus, but are there more subtypes? Are there different ones? And actually, do we have better ways to manage and support people living with tinnitus already, but we're just not um, sophisticated enough in how we're defining that tinnitus subtype and, and looking at how we may do that to really pursue research forward. So those are our priorities and how are we taking them forward? Um, well, the BTA is looking to invest over £280,000 in research um, in the current financial year. And the majority of that is going on two large research grant awards, one to King's College London to look at um, novel cytokines as biomarkers for tinnitus. So looking at the UK twin study, identifying the cytokines in there and seeing if there are any differences um, in those who where tinnitus is and isn't present. And could that potentially um, lead to our understanding of, a, of an opportunity to identify a biomarker? And secondly, um, working with Professor David McAlpine at Macquarie University in Australia um, to look at developing a reliable objective measure of tinnitus. So again, um, looking at those really key priorities and can we find a way to objectively measure tinnitus? And that's one of the first studies in tinnitus as well, which will look at using um, artificial intelligence and computer learning as well to see if we can develop a predictive model of tinnitus. And can we actually take on some of that earlier work that was funded by the BTA by um, David McAlpine was at UCL and also Roland Shetty, who was there with him and really try and see if we can develop and enhance that computational model to, to get an objective measure. So again, these are really responding to the challenges that we know industry are, are giving us to really take tinnitus forward, uh, research forward and what's needed. Um, so yeah, very hopeful that, that these will come off. Um, like I said, we're investing a lot of money in this. And, and um, again, we had a number of people um, living with tinnitus who joined our panels and, and fed back as well in terms of what projects we should support. And these two scored um, very strongly amongst both um, people living with tinnitus and also um, researchers in the field as well in terms of what will take our research forward and our understanding forward. Alongside that, um, really exciting news, we're looking to um, joint fund a PhD with RNID um, and hopefully we'll have more news on that um, very soon. Um, and we've set up a tinnitus researcher network as well, so we're looking to enable researchers to collaborate, to share ideas, to um, look at funding pots and how they might be used for tinnitus research as well, because a key finding of some of our um, other work is that actually we need to look at how to build capacity within the tinnitus research community as well. And, and how do we do that and how do we help? And we think this is one way that the BTA can really just help by putting in some infrastructure that can, can enable some of those conversations to happen as well. Um, if you want to know more about the research that, that we're doing, we have a um, newsletter that goes out every month as well called Explore and you can sign up via info at tinnitus.org.uk. Um, and some of the research that we've been involved in. So this, again, lots of colleagues involved in this um, internationally and uh, the American Tinnitus Association as well were also really involved um, in a piece of research just looking at the impact of COVID-19 on tinnitus as well. So over 3,000 participants from 48 countries and there were some really key findings actually Within the UK, 46% of people found that tinnitus had been made worse due to lockdown and lifestyle changes during um, the COVID-19 epidemic. And four out of 10 people who had COVID-19 symptoms reported that tinnitus was more bothersome as well. So we're seeing a lot of work now coming out saying that tinnitus is a symptom of long COVID and is a, a really interesting field to explore, actually, because this suggests there's a another mechanism or a mechanism to trigger tinnitus that we may not have been able to find before or may be open to investigation as well so we can again better understand that to, to treat the, the broader tinnitus population as well as those who who have tinnitus as a result of long COVID. Um, another article that again um, we worked on with colleagues from the University of Manchester and Macquarie University um, looked at the natural history of tinnitus. So again, this was 
um, really important work. There's very few longitudinal studies into tinnitus that looks at how tinnitus changes over time. Um, and within this, uh, we worked with the UK Biobank data. Um, there was a group of people who were asked at two time points, um, two questions about tinnitus. And what we found was actually over time, equal numbers of people, so around 9% said that their tinnitus either got worse or it's improved. And 18% said they no longer had tinnitus, who, who had tinnitus at the first time point. So actually we can see some change and some um, um, development in terms of how people report tinnitus. Um, there was interesting things around what the main controllable risk factor was, which was loud noise at work. Um, and we found that males were more likely to experience tinnitus, but women were more likely to report it as bothersome. So some really key things that, that could help us understand what biobanks can tell us about tinnitus and increase our knowledge. But also the study shows that um, tinnitus didn't change for many people and we need to understand what's going on there. And whilst the study was um, quite basic, there's, there's a real call here to better understand some of that epidemiology and, and natural history of tinnitus and maybe examine it in a, in a more robust fashion than we're, we're able to with the data that's within the UK Biobank. So what do we think we could do next? Well, one is to produce a tinnitus biobank. And this is something that I've been talking about for a couple of years now and something that I'm really keen for the, the BTA to pursue is looking at how do we develop a disease specific biobank for tinnitus, which helps us understand some of that information and data in a more robust way and could ultimately really help us answer some of those research questions that I presented or research priorities that I presented early on and actually look at addressing more than one of those potentially in, in one go and really help drive forward our work as well. So um, hopefully that was a bit of a whistle stop in terms of what we've been up to. I'll stop there and hope it sparks some questions and look forward to getting involved in the Q&A later. Back to you, Nick. Thank you very much, David, and pretty much to time too. So I appreciate that because we've got uh, a lot to fit in. So the next person who is going to give us a, a quick um, presentation is um, Hazel. So over to you. Yeah, so I'm, uh, first of all, thank you, um, David, for your presentation and thanks to BTA for co-organizing and co-hosting this webinar with us. I hope the um, audience, uh, not just the people who are here today, but who might be watching this recording later will find it interesting to uh, see a quick overview of what the different organizations are doing for research. I think my theme, talking on behalf of Tinnitus Hub, is all about empowerment. We want to empower people with tinnitus and, and tinnitus communities um, to have uh, more of a voice in research and be able to steer research um, more directly. Um, we want to be, I suppose, a voice for, for tinnitus patients. Um, and what we hear all the time from, uh, from the tinnitus talk community that we run and, and people with tinnitus that we engage with is they are not uh, happy, they're not satisfied with the current state of tinnitus treatments and tinnitus care. They want um, better treatments, more effective treatments, and uh, essentially uh, a cure. And uh, tinnitus sufferers want to be taken um, seriously. Many of them feel like that they, they are not. Uh, I use the word sufferers deliberately, even though I know it's it's uh, uh, some people can consider it maybe stigmatizing or so. But um, and of course, not everyone who has tinnitus suffers from it. We know that. Um, but those who do uh, suffer, um, and sometimes uh, very severely, uh, are, in my opinion, the ones uh, who most deserve a voice and who, um, whom, you know, research essentially should be for. It should be to, to help them uh, and um, not so much the people who are, you know, already coping quite well with their tinnitus. Um, so those are our aims, and in, to, in order to achieve those, we, uh, you know, uh, help people connect with peers through the Tinnitus Talk Forum. We educate people on ongoing research and treatments. 
We also tried to form a, like a bridge function between patients and researchers and raise awareness on unmet needs. Um, I think we come at this problem of tinnitus maybe a bit differently than the other organizations here because we we have a different history, I suppose. We, we emerged, if you will, from the Tinnitus Talk uh, online support forum, uh, which as far as I know is the biggest, biggest uh, Tinnitus forum. Um, which was launched 10 years ago and then we still managed that and sort of uh, our scope of activities grew from there but that community remains at the core of what we do and we try to represent uh, that community and the multitude of voices there so uh, we're very much you know online global bottom-up um, uh, we also have you know to put it bluntly very little resources so we're run by by volunteers, all of whom have tinnitus themselves, including me. Um, and that means we don't have the means to directly fund research. Um, so we look for other ways to promote, support, stimulate um, the kind of research that people with tinnitus want. Oh, if we look at the research field, um, I don't want to sound too negative, but there are a lot of ch challenges that uh, are yet to be overcome if we're going to uh, achieve a cure. Uh, David certainly mentioned some of these already, and I know they're mentioned in that paper uh, you talked about, David, why is there no cure yet, which is a very informative paper. Certainly the field suffers from a lack of funding, uh, a certain degree of fragmentation, perhaps due to to the fact that tinnitus never neatly fits into one discipline or another, so it requires a lot of collaboration across disciplines. There is still a fairly limited understanding of the pathophysiology of tinnitus, so the underlying ear or brain mechanisms, uh, though I certainly want to recognize and acknowledge the important work done by, uh, by researchers like Joseph Rauschecker, Will Sedley, Susan Shore, to name a few. Um, so certainly important advances are being made, but we need to understand a lot more. Um, the heterogeneity of the condition is certainly a challenge where, as David mentioned, people are lumped together in one group of tinnitus patients, whereas actually we should be looking at them separately. The lack of objective measure is certainly a challenge. And then I would say, you know, a um, there could certainly be more of a focus on the priorities that uh, or expectations that people with tinnitus have and what we do hear from our community is that they would like to see more of a shift um, and I think it's already ongoing but they would like to see more of a shift towards uh, research that focuses on um, developing treatments uh, that reduce the tinnitus itself um, rather than just managing tinnitus. So what Tinnitus Hub does for research, as I mentioned, we, uh, we don't, we can't fund any research directly, but what we can do and are very well positioned to do is to gather data for research because we have this very broad online reach. Um, we're very well positioned to uh, conduct online surveys. We've done a couple of big ones over the years that have gathered each over 5,000 uh, responses, which are pretty good sample sizes. Uh, and we've shared that data with many researchers and that has led to a number of publications. And the second category of, of work that we do is just to try and represent the patient voice by attending research events, talking directly to researchers and partnering with researchers. Uh, we have joint research projects with with different researchers. So here's an example of our online uh, data gathering activities, uh, the Tinnitus and the Body survey that we uh, launched last year, which gathered over 8,000 responses, so a wealth of data. We asked people about tinnitus characteristics, um, symptoms of somatic, tinnitus and also the presence or absence of other health conditions. Uh, the data has been analyzed by Sarah Michels who um, used it to come up with a proposal for diagnostic criteria for somatic tinnitus which could be very useful because it's this is one of the forms of tinnitus that can actually be adequately treated 
sometimes even cured by physiotherapy. So if we're able to uh, adequately diagnose um, that group of people, that could be very helpful. This is one of our uh, own research projects that um, we are conducting in partnership. Uh, we initiated in, uh, together with researchers from Regensburg University and also brought on board Nottingham University and the BTA as partners, uh, which is related to biobanks, a topic David also just mentioned, um, where the aim is to create an inventory of biobanks out there in the world that have tinnitus data or any data that's relevant for tinnitus research and then to um, urge tinnitus researchers to use that data. Um, like many other research fields, uh, a lack of data is a, is a challenge for tinnitus research, but there is already a lot of useful existing data in those biobanks um, that hasn't been analyzed. Um, so this could provide another push for certainly cure-focused research. As I mentioned, we strongly believe that people with tinnitus should be heard and the research priorities should be driven by the needs of the tinnitus community. And um, we're doing a, um, engaged in a couple of activities to, to make that happen, to facilitate that. We've started doing monthly uh, voting rounds or polls, if you will, where we round up all the academic papers uh, published on tinnitus in the previous month and people get to vote there, uh, which is their favorite paper. Uh, and we'll continue to do that to gather uh, lots and lots of data that shows what is the type of research that people with tinnitus most value. Uh, we're also planning to soon launch a survey where we will directly ask people what they expect from research. And so those outcomes we will then use to advocate to the re research community and engage with them. And um, um, ultimately, uh, that will hopefully lead to people with tinnitus being included in the research process more early on when it comes to setting up research priorities and research agendas. Uh, as for the future, we plan to continue to do what we're doing. Um, uh, we think there's more uh, that can be harnessed from online communities. Uh, one thing we really hope to be able to do is build our own online database that is integrated into the Tinnitus Talk Forum uh, that would allow us to gather longitudinal data. Uh, as David mentioned, that's uh, there's... Um, a uh, uh, lack uh, of this kind of data. So someone would sign up to the Tinnitus Talk Forum, provides uh, answer a few questions. Again, three months later, six months, a year, three years later, etc. We would be able to track people over time, see how they develop, if people get better or worse, and what are the factors involved in that. And we will certainly continue to support any campaigns to influence research funding and increase. Uh, funding for cure-focused research and expand our citizen science activities to directly involve the TINES community in research. And that brings me to the end. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Hazel, and uh, interesting insight into the work that you're doing. Um, so I'm going to call on Phil next to speak. Um, about what he's been up to and his insights into Tinnitus research. Okay, so I'm, I'm really happy to be uh, invited to be part of the forum here and, and to be here as a representative of the American Tinnitus Association. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am a, a research scientist um, and I've been working on tinnitus uh, for the last 10 years or more. Um, and uh, I was asked to join the uh, board of uh, the ATA a few years back. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to have, have joined because I was uh, interested in not only um, doing primary research uh, on tinnitus, but also um, seeing the real personal aspect of, of tinnitus and its impact on uh, my participants in the research really uh, gave me a strong drive to, to want to try and reach out and help more and in other ways. And I, I'm hoping that I can be able to do that as a board member of the ATA. Um, so first off here, sorry. Um, so just, just to talk a little bit about partnerships, uh, 
unfortunately, the, the gap on the Atlantic is, is maybe larger than we'd want it to be. Um, but uh, on the positive side, we've uh, begun to uh, partner a lot more with the uh, BTA in, in recent years. And uh, this did culminate uh, just before COVID um, in a, a networking uh, event with researchers, uh, both the BTA and ATA held. Um, and uh, really it was just a, an initial foray into um, getting people together and, and sharing ideas um, and seeing what the sort of interest was and research capacity there, there was uh, for tinnitus. And uh, we look forward to being able to meet again in person and do these sorts of things in the future. Um, but actually, uh, a good idea might be to try and uh, do such a thing, uh, even as an online forum like this um, as well. So the future uh, for tinnitus research, I think right now is, is a, a relatively positive time for tinnitus research. Um, Notably, the amount of research that's published every year is, is increasing um, for tinnitus. And um, I think a lot of that is also going to be driven uh, uh, in particular by advances and interest, increasing interest in hearing loss. And so if we just stop to take a think uh, and think about how, how common is tinnitus um, in, in uh, many developed uh, countries, um, tinnitus ranks among uh, the most prevalent of, of chronic uh, disorders in adults. And um, this uh, may be surprising to some and, and, and maybe not to others, um, but it really speaks to um, the clear need for more information and more uh, research dollars uh, being moved towards uh, tinnitus. And I think the research efforts, uh, again, I think uh, the BTA has had a hand in, uh, in helping in terms of trying to really account for um, the economic impacts even, uh, or the, the other quality of life impacts that, that occur with tinnitus are going to help uh, those sorts of efforts. Um, and I think a really strong direction uh, is going to be uh, coming out soon. And it's really a buzz in the, in the auditory science community here, even though it's been a little bit researched uh, for a few decades, um, it's the Lancet Commission report that happened a few years back, um, really clearly showing that uh, the role of hearing loss uh, is the largest single risk factor for dementia. Um, and that was a really big uh, and important finding and, and um, indication for the field uh, that, that really hearing loss is something that, that ought to be taken more seriously and, and really has uh, a lot of um, overlap with other areas of research. And the important outcome of this sort of thing will be that more people are going to be paying attention to trying to find treatments for hearing loss. And as a result, um, these sorts of treatments are going to very likely have a role in impacting tinnitus cures and, and treatments. Um, and it's a not unlikely a scenario that, that a uh, treatment or effective uh, treatment for hearing loss or prevention of hearing loss and things like this will have a role for either curing or preventing tinnitus. I just wanted to speak a little bit about the funding climate in the United States. Um, the biggest uh, funder, of course, is, is the NIH and the branch of the NIH, the NIDCD, uh, Deafness and Communication Disorders, um, is a large funder for, for tinnitus. Uh, um, and, and hearing loss research. Um, the Department of Defense, the DOD, uh, has historically been a, a funder of tinnitus research, but rather unfortunately, uh, a year or, or a couple of years ago, they removed tinnitus from their funding line. And so this is um, something that's not very positive and something we're working towards trying to change and, and get tinnitus back on, on the funding stream um, for obvious reasons. Um, but also an underutilized resource uh, that scientists need to look at here, especially in the US, is the National Sciences Foundation. The NSF has funded research in the past for tinnitus, and that's another um, avenue. And there are a number of associations and societies uh, in the US, including the ATA, um, that have helped support uh, research. But all in all, uh, as I was saying, in, in, just given, say, just purely on the prevalence of tinnitus, um, 
uh, the funding for tinnitus itself is no, nowhere near enough in terms of making large advances uh, quickly um, for, for tinnitus. And this is something that needs to, to change. And as I'm saying, it might be able to piggyback on um, research that's going to increase uh, and funding dollars that's going to be moved towards hearing loss and the connections to dementia. Um, so this year actually marks the uh, 50th anniversary of the ATA, which we're really happy about. Um, and over this time, um, depending on your opinion, you know, we've had uh, $6 million is either a large or a small amount in terms of research funding over this period. And um, we've uh, been able to uh, allocate $150,000 worth of funding um, for this year, uh, which we hope to continue uh, year on um, for the next coming years. And uh, in this particular case, we are trying to fund six grants um, that support different levels of research. So larger grants that really try and are aimed towards uh, making big advances if they can, uh, towards uh, finding cures and treatments for tinnitus. Um, but I think a really important thing that's been touched on already today um, is the importance of funding uh, researchers at the beginning of their career as a number of uh, researchers uh, that are in the, on the board or uh, associated with the uh, ATA Scientific Advisory Council are researchers who were funded by the ATA or other organizations, um, including the BTA, um, as they were uh, beginning their research careers. And this is an important thing uh, to keep, basically to keep good minds and good researchers in the community. Um, and this is something that we, uh, we believe is important and, and want to continue to try and do. I just wanted to highlight a little bit of uh, research that's more or less uh, current um, in terms of talking about exciting directions, especially on, on the angle of cures and treatments. Um, I'm sure everyone's uh, aware of, of the research uh, mostly pioneered here by uh, Susan Shore at the University of Michigan, um, really bringing together very nicely some animal research and then translation into human trials. And these things are ongoing, uh, but so far the results are, are pretty encouraging and uh, we're awaiting uh, for these results to be reported uh, in the near future. Um, and uh, another example of research, which includes a, uh, a researcher on the American Tinnitus Association board, uh, came out recently uh, looking at the angle of neuroinflammation. And this is a good example of research um, that's looking at uh, from an angle of hearing loss um, and also dovetailing that with um, uh, outcomes for tinnitus. So uh, when there is uh, acoustic trauma, uh, notably in the form of uh, noise, um, there are particular responses uh, in the nervous system that uh, are a neuroinflammatory pathway, so to speak, and a number of proteins are, are activated uh, in response to this injury. And some of these uh, responses are actually harmful in terms of changing uh, what we believe are directly related to outcomes for tinnitus uh, in terms of uh, cell death, and also more notably changing uh, relative balances of excitation and inhibition uh, in the auditory pathway. And so this research uh, I thought was very exciting because um, it was an example of uh, a case where they were being able to take the animals and either give them tinnitus and take it away um, or uh, reverse, reverse the tinnitus uh, with some form of treatment uh, after induction. And uh, using, uh, albeit um, some not, not favored uh, model for, for tinnitus detection in these animals. Uh, these researchers were also um, smart to try and use a, or su successfully use another uh, form of uh, tinnitus detection in these animals, uh, which showed the same results. And basically they uh, exposed a group of animals and um, uh, on the lower left here, uh, you can see that there's a difference between the red and blue lines. Basically just take that as a proxy for um, these animals are showing evidence for tinnitus whereas uh, a group of animals which had a genetic manipulation which did not have one of these pro-inflammatory proteins, they do not create this protein, these animals after noise exposure did not show uh, any signs of tinnitus. Um, and 
Uh, they also had an example of where they noise exposed an animals. And so these are the panels on the right hand side. Um, and they show that uh, the level of, of this um, uh, protein, TNF alpha, uh, is raised after noise exposure. But in animals that are given um, this uh, blocker for this, uh, um, a drug blocker uh, of TNF alpha um, before the noise exposure, um, or immediately after, sorry, the noise exposure, do not show changes uh, in this uh, pro-inflammatory response. And indeed, those animals uh, that were treated as such did not show evidence for behavioral evidence uh, for tinnitus. So this is really, really exciting, um, I think, and, and uh, it's really new, relatively new research. Um, and this, I think, is going to spark a number of, and already has, I know, a number of drug trials um, uh, for tinnitus as well. Um, and again, these are both uh, hearing loss research related and, and tinnitus research related. Um, and uh, we we'll look forward to hearing about these results in the near future. Um, other research I just wanted to highlight, uh, some research I did uh, with my colleague, Will Sedley, who has been mentioned already, um, and who has been funded by the BTA. Um, and this research uh, is really important, as, again, as already mentioned, because it's trying to look at getting a relatively easy biomarker for tinnitus in humans. And uh, I think the, the reasons for this have already been outlined. It's extremely important to have a biomarker um, in order to show um, some form of, of efficacy of treatment for, for a particular trial of treatment. And without a, a clear biomarker, it's going to be hard to really push research forward uh, in this regard. And unfortunately, to, the, to date, we still don't really have a really um, convincing uh, biomarker for tinnitus in humans. Um, nevertheless, uh, we, we think that this um, paradigm, which just simply uses different loudnesses of, of tones that are presented uh, passively um, uh, and, and, and or actively to uh, research participants um, with tinnitus, or in this case, uh, some matched uh, controls. Um, if we look at the right-hand side, just in terms of the diagnosticity, um, we really saw an effective uh, ability to uh, for this biomarker to distinguish uh, those who did and those who did not have tinnitus um, uh, at a level of uh, the area under the curve here is at 0 0.77. So this is actually, um, might not sound like a lot, but actually is quite high in, in terms of uh, uh, diagnosis and, and separation. Um, and so we're hoping to, to build on this work um, and we're continuing uh, to do that. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight, uh, I was able to steal from uh, Nottingham when I was there, um, a very clever uh, animal researcher uh, named Joel Berger, and he's here with me now at the University of Iowa. And we're uh, continuing our research where we are um, directly comparing um, uh, markers that, that he explored in, in animals, in his case, uh, research that he did with guinea pigs. And we have uh, the opportunity here to do uh, invasive recordings in uh, epilepsy patients who are being monitored chronically um, for uh, surgical resection of their epileptic focus. And in rare cases, we have opportunities to also have people who happen to also have tinnitus. And uh, we recently had uh, a patient who came through with tinnitus and uh, we simply just played the same sorts of sounds uh, to her that, that Joel had been playing uh, to his guinea pigs that showed a evidence for a biomarker of tinnitus. And really encouragingly, um, in this single case, albeit, uh, we've started to see uh, similar sorts of responses. There's a lot of caveats to this type of research and, then, and uh, the, the analyses are ongoing, um, but uh, we hope to continue to try and do this research um, and importantly, we'll be able to do it with uh, people who don't uh, have tinnitus and also show specificity of, of this uh, biomarker potentially. And uh, that's all, thank you. That's great, thank you very much, Phil. And um, last but certainly not least is Ralph Holm from RNID um, and he's gonna give his presentation now. Okay, so <clears throat> good, good evening everyone and, and thank you for um, for inviting me um, to, join, to join, join the panel. So um, as you've heard, so, so I'm here representing um, RMID, 
Um, and obviously, we were actually on hearing loss until um, sort of November last year, and we've changed our name to to RNID. Um, so, so the purpose of RNID is to make life fully inclusive for deaf people and those with hearing loss um, and tinnitus. And we work um, essentially in sort of three domains. Um, I, I lead our research work, which is all about um, advancing treatments for hearing loss and, and tinnitus. Um, but we also work to campaign to make life inclusive um, for um, people who are um, deaf or have hearing loss or tinnitus. And we've got a real kind of focus on access to health um, and um, access to employment um, at, at the moment. Um, and then the third area of our work is around supporting and helping people today with information and, and support um, about hearing loss and tinnitus. So in terms of our um, research vision, um, you, you know, we want a future um, where there are treatments um, to prevent the onset of hearing loss or the, or the progression of hearing loss. Um, you know, we want treatments to enable people to regain their hearing. Um, and within that topic, um, you know, we're also, that also includes you know, improving medical devices like hearing aids and cochlear implants. Um, and then finally, um, and of course, of relevance to this evening's event is, you know, we want treatments um, that will silence tinnitus um, in, in the future. So, so in terms of um, our approach, um, we, we're a funder of research. So we fund research in universities, hospitals, um, companies all around the world. Um, our funding is sort of targeted in sort of three areas. Um, we, we want to fund sort of discovery research that will kind of increase our understanding um, of the causes of tinnitus and, and hearing loss and, and sort of, you know, um, lay the ground for future treatments. So, so we fund discovery research. We also fund what we call translational research. So that's research that sort of builds on those discoveries and, and develops them into treatments that could ultimately be tested in, in the clinic. Um, and then finally, as some of the other speakers have mentioned, um, we fund research to build um, human capacity for, for research. So we fund PhD studentships and, and, and fellowships as, as well. So, so within the, the um, area of um, tinnitus, um, our funding is very much targeted at, as I just sort of mentioned, you know, identifying the causes, the kind of biological basis of tinnitus, which we need to understand if we're, if we're going to develop um, treatments. Um, we also fund research that actually will develop treatments, um, perhaps test um, potential um, um, treatments to um, silence tinnitus. And then again, as others have mentioned, we also fund research that we hope will lead to objective ways of measuring tinnitus, which is um, going to be really critical, I think. So, so for the last bit of my presentation, I just wanted to highlight some of the projects that we're funding in, in these areas. So, so if you look at sort of causes and mechanisms um, first, so, so, so actually, you know, um, a number of years ago, we funded research, a series of projects actually, that I think has really helped show that tinnitus um, develops in a sort of two-stage step. You know, so, so you can have an insult um, to, to, the, to the ear, to the peripheral um, system, perhaps loud noise that, that, that causes hyperactivity within the central um, auditory system. And it seems like for the first you know, couple of weeks or, or months, that is driven by the, the cochlear, by damage to the cochlear. But then over time, it becomes independent of the cochlear and it becomes um, chronic with, with it within, the, within the brain. So, so, we're, so we're funding a couple of projects to kind of build on, on those, those observations and try to understand, you know, how does brain activity change as tinnitus is going from this kind of acute phase to, to a chronic um, phase. So, so to do this, we're, we're funding a PhD um, studentship in, in Oxford, looking at animals where, where they're recording <coughs> um, brain, brain activity um, before the animals develop tinnitus, during the, the time when they're developing tinnitus, and then you know for several um, weeks, um, months after they've, they've um, had had their tinnitus, and really seeing you know how does brain activity change during the course of, of developing um, tinnitus, and in that project we're also actually looking at 
how tinnitus related activity changes when the animals are asleep or awake, um, which, which could be really interesting. So that's in animals. D David um, in his talk mentioned um, a project that we're about to co-fund um, to, together. And again, this is looking at you know, how, how does um, brain activity change as tinnitus is developing. The difference here is, is that we're actually going to be looking at people. So, so we're funding, going to be funding a PhD studentship in Newcastle, starts later, later this year. Um, and the idea is to recruit people who have um, just recently acquired their tinnitus, so they've only, maybe only had their tinnitus for four weeks, um, <clears throat> you know, record brain, brain activity, um, and then look at that brain activity again six months later. And I think it'd be really interesting to see, you know, what patterns of neural activity are kind of consistent over that time, you know, what patterns of neural activity perhaps um, disappear um, over, to, over that time, or how, how it changes. Um, and clearly, you know, understanding this is going to be really important because, you know, if we can understand those kind of early changes in brain activity, um, we can target those and, and try and prevent tinnitus from becoming um, chronic. So, so in terms of um, treatments, um, we're funding a couple of projects that are, are very kind of um, focused on developing um, treatments for, for tinnitus and, and I guess very kind of focused on trying to reset that um, tinnitus related um, kind of neural, neural activity. That the first one is just getting underway, literally, um, this, this, this month um, at Flinders University in Australia. Um, and the researchers there um, are testing um, a non-invasive brain stimulation technique called transcranial direct current stimulation. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it basically means um, that um, you can sort of stimulate the very small electrical current um, different parts of the brain and disrupt or, or kind of alter the, the kind of neural activity. Initial um, studies are quite promising and researchers have shown that they can temporarily reduce some types of tinnitus for sort of 24 hours. So what we're going to be doing is funding a project to kind of fine tune that, you know, can we, um, can the researchers push the, the, the amount of time that tinnitus is, is suppressed? And they're going to be using a new technique, a high definition technique, which allows them to much more precisely stimulate different parts um, of, of the brain. So, so that's a kind of exciting project um, and it could, could lead to new ways of treating, treat, um, treating tinnitus um, if, if it's successful. Um, <clears throat> the second kind of project in this area that we're funding, and again, it's just sort of starting up, um, is a, a project that ultimately aims to, to develop a drug um, for, for, for tinnitus. And this is building on research um, from the neuropathic pain field. So, so there are a lot of similarities between neuropathic pain, which is essentially a phantom, phantom pain, um, and tinnitus, which is obviously a phantom sound. And so the researchers at King's College um, are exploring um, a particular ion channel that seems to be important in neuropathic pain. They're developing drugs to block that channel and, and treat neuropathic pain. So, so our project um, is going to test where, whether those drugs and those channels um, are also import, important in tinnitus or not. Um, and they'll be testing that in animals um, with experiments taking place in Nottingham as, as well. So, so that's really, really exciting and could, could lead to, to new sort of treatments in, in the future. Um, and then finally, um, in terms of measuring um, tinnitus, I think we, you know, we've heard why it's so, so important. At the moment, we're, we're you know, dependent on asking people whether they have tinnitus or not, which is very subjective and, and makes doing you know, clinically testing treatments um, very tricky. Um, and we also really need um, ways of measuring tinnitus that we can do in people, but also do the same measurement in animals so that we can really link those two, um, you know, we can link effects we see in animals with um, effects in, in people. So we do need to develop these tests. Um, we're, we're funding a project at Newcastle um, University, um, ex exploring whether we can, again, use kind of recordings of brain activity um, as an objective um, measure for tinnitus. And so the researchers um, um, there are going to be or are um, recording kind of brain activity in people with tinnitus. 
um, while they listen to a sound with gaps in it. Um, and so, so people who have got tinnitus, when there's a silent gap in the sound, they, they perhaps won't hear that silent gap in the same way, it'll be filled in with the tinnitus. Um, and the idea is that that will show up in, in, the, in the kind of the brain recordings um, that, that are being made. So, so that's kind of a, a sort of a bit of a taste um, of, of what um, RNID um, is, is doing in tinnitus. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Ralph. And I think what's really interesting to see is the different approaches, but the overlap and the direction of travel where there are similarities between each of the organisations. Now, we're going to throw it over to questions. I was going to say from the floor, but it's more likely to be the sofa. Uh, we've got a number coming in. We'll try to get to as many as we can, but there's still time to um, put your question in and um, to upvote any questions that you think are particularly important that you would like to see. Um, I'm actually going to start with one. I think I might pad it out a little bit because I don't know whether this one relates to biomarkers or, or comorbidities, but we've been asked, do the panellists think that there's a connection borne out in the literature between high cholesterol and tinnitus. Anybody like to take um, that? No. I think I'll kick off by saying I don't think we know. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot um, out there at the moment in the literature about it. Um, it's certainly one of those studies that existing biobanks may be able to shed some light on. It's the type of thing that you could research with existing data. Um, but to my knowledge, there's no particular studies out there linking the two. Okay. Well, Bill's well, opened his mic, so I'm hoping he's going to come in with something more. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just mostly going to say I'm not aware of research that shows a clear uh, connection. Um, but I'll just speak to one of the reasons why I highlighted the uh, neuroinflammation work is because an inflammatory pathway is something that might account, uh, and I might be over overstretching this idea, but um, uh, it could potentially account for the very large variability we get in response to animals and people to the same trauma. Um, and the and inflammatory pathways are also highly uh, interactive with our environment. And so um, while we've never really found clear dietary uh, influences um, for, uh, for tinnitus that I'm aware of, uh, although anecdotally people have definitely found certain things, um, I guess what I'm saying is, is the, the neuroinflammation pathway uh, for me gives voice to the, these ideas in terms of interaction between the environment and the person's particular um, milieu, as it were, uh, within uh, their body and their response to a, a, an acoustic trauma or some other uh, trauma to the system. Um, and and that, that response is not going to be identical in every single person. And so then the particular response that's had in a, in a given person then might lead them to having tinnitus or not. Maybe they both get hearing loss, but one gets tinnitus and the other does not. One develops tinnitus years later from a, a further insult. Um, I think it opens the door for me. That's why I was really interested in, in that uh, research because it opens the door for answers potentially to the large variability, as, I, as I've said already, in, in um, tinnitus and its expression. Right. Thanks for that, Phil. So it seems the answer is let's let's dig into data a wee bit more to see and find the answer. But the question that I've been um, fed next is probably the big question that everybody wants to know. How realistic is it to expect a viable treatment for tinnitus to be available in the next five years? Everybody's smiling sweetly at me, but nobody seems to want to take it on. So I'm going to, yeah, Ralph, um, you take uh, this one, please. Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so obviously, you know, we all we all kind of hope hope that there'll be um, you know treatments as, as soon as possible. Um, you know, I think we've, we had some sort of promising um, drug treatments in the pipeline. David mentioned the, the Tiffany um, drug that was quite advanced stages of development, but unfortunately. You know, it didn't. It didn't work work out. Um, so you know, so I think 
I think it's probably going to be more more than five five years, but there's fantastic research, um, you know, coming along, um, and you know, I'm sure there will be treatments in in the future. Um, I, th I think you know we've still spoken about there's quite a lot of heterogeneity in, in tinnitus, so it's, I don't think it's going to be like one treatment that's going to be sort of suitable for everybody. We're probably going to need lots of different treatments for different types of of, of tinnitus, um, but. But you know we're learning more about the condition all the time, and I'm you know really um, confident that you know we will get treatments eventually. That's great, Hazel. Did you have um, an opinion on this? I, I well, uh, I don't have a very um, well formed opinion on that because it's just so hard to to predict right it's incredibly hard to predict and there have been a number of times where um we've seen this in the on the tinnitus talk community people got really hyped about a potential new treatment and then it fell through in the last phase of the clinical trial for instance um and uh there is still a lot of progress that needs to be made on the other hand a breakthrough can be just around the corner and we don't know it so <laughs> i really would dare to put a number on it i also do think like my gut feeling says within the next five years is not super likely um yeah nick do you mind if i ask a question to one of the other uh, panelists but i don't want to take away questions from uh, you know our audience <laughs> No, that, that should be All fine right. related to this sort of time scale. Yeah, so, I, well, I, I have a question for Philip and, and one for Ralph, but they're quite different. But um, Philip, you were talking about, um, I think it was in relation to, was it the Department of Defense or one of the government agencies in the US that had sort of removed tinnitus as a key priority or something like that, which sounds very concerning to me. And you mentioned that ATA wants to lobby those government agencies or is lobbying um, to put tinnitus higher on the funding uh, agenda, right? But how do you go about that? Because, uh, you know, lobbying, especially in the US, uh, you know, it requires a lot of resources and and dedication and you know lawyers sometimes and you know there there are um uh, firms out there that you can hire uh for for many millions of dollars to lobby to get uh, new legislation passed but uh how do you do that with you know on a i assume within certain limitations that you face <laughs> yeah you're right it, it is it is limited i think the um where we are able to uh, have some influence is, is to be able to be on on particular panels or or meetings or committees that that have the same individuals who are then speaking to politicians um, and advising them about uh, particular um, research uh, focus or directions. Um, and so that is is sometimes we are able to get invited to the table but not all the time and we can't we can't force our way in unfortunately um but uh i think the uh example of the tinnitus hub is is another uh, good point in which another way to do this of course is to have a voice with a large number of people um who are saying things quite quite clearly like tinnitus needs to have a funding line um, I'll, I'll admit my uh, my surprise, and I don't actually know why it was removed um, from the list of, of uh, conditions that they, they specifically are looking to fund, um, especially since, um, as I think most people are aware, the, um, uh, the Department of, of Veterans Affairs uh, spends its highest line of compensation is on tinnitus, right? It's, it's not hearing loss. It's not brain injury, it's not back disorder or, or things like this, it's tinnitus. Um, so it should have a really large voice um, and, and, it, and it doesn't. There's still this disconnect as I, as I was alluding to uh, before in, in my, my presentation. Um, and uh, I, I think, uh, as you mentioned, Hazel, giving a voice to people who are, are basically calling, um, you know, get, get the word out to your local politician. You know, we want more funding uh, for this, because because it is so common, because it can be so debilitating. Um, 
So that was sorry, that was a long answer to, to your question, but um, uh, I think it hopefully brings up some of the issues and, and maybe some of the positive directions forward. Okay, we're, we're still actually um, getting quite a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So if it's okay with, with you, um, I'll move on to, to some of those, Hazel. Um, there's been talk, a couple of people have actually asked the question, um, which expresses there's some hope about a, a US trial, which is using um, oxytocin as a nasal spray for reducing the impact of tinnitus. Um, do you think that the, that hope is, is justified? And if so, perhaps when should we hear about results? I guess that ties into, will that be within five years, I guess? Yeah, I'll go. I think that's just, it's a pilot study at the moment. So they're looking at running a short proof of concept study. So it's, it's, it's very early phase stuff. I think it'll be a while before we have any um, sort of strong um, information on it. Um, looking at the clinicaltrials.gov website, um, they're saying it should be reporting around June this year. So, so you'll have early data from the um, proof of concept trial, but it's, you know, 30 participants. So it's, it's a way off, I think, um, being anything um, particularly out there, you know, it's, 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 it'll have to go through a few more trails yet, but trials are stages. But um, again, we know that um, nasal sprays have been regularly prescribed um, in the UK, at least for tinnitus with um, sort of varying success. So it's good to see um, a trial that looks well designed to, to try and answer that one way or the other. All right, th that's great. I think there's been other questions about other potential treatments as well, such as um, FX322, which is being used for sensing and real healing loss. Is it a similar situation, do you feel, with these that they're still very early days? So, so, so yeah, so, so the, um, the, the FX32 um, sort of um, drug, drug trial, that, that's, um, I think that's in a sort of phase, phase two at the moment, so it's a bit more um, advanced and it's been, you know, done, run by a pharmaceutical um, company. Um, it's, it's quite interesting in, in that it, the, 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 the drug is trying to regenerate damaged hair, hair cells within, within the cochlea and, and doing so in a way that it kind of produces supporting cells and hair cells. Um, so, yeah, so, so it's, quite, it's quite exciting. Um, you know, obviously, um, we don't really know the, how, how, how well it's going to work. I, I believe the results will sort of come out later, later this year. Um, you know, and I guess in, in terms of its relevance to tinnitus, um, I suppose, you know, if it proves hearing, then that might, um, you know, reduce tinnitus, I suppose. Yeah, I think Ralph's right. I think it's really interesting in terms of what's happening with um, restoration of hearing at the moment. There's a number of trials happening and there's a lot of real activity in that area. What it means for tinnitus, I'm not sure we're entirely clear on yet. Um, you know, some of the research that um, we've been talking about in terms of, you know, the theory that tinnitus has an ignition site, but then there's something that maintains the signal. So once you're in that signal maintenance, does restoration of hearing recover or obliterate tinnitus or not? Are really big unanswered questions, I think, for looking at restorative hearing and what it means for tinnitus. But it's, it's certainly exciting that you're seeing um, hearing research get sophisticated more and more in terms of what trials are happening. And you hope that that will then inform tinnitus trials as well and looking at, you know, what happens. And I guess if FX322 is successful, then the next, you know, part of that, of course, they'll be interested in looking and assessing it for tinnitus market as well. So, so yeah, real potential. But yeah, I think it's still watch this space in terms of exactly what it means for tinnitus. Okay. So an, a, another question has come in about a therapy that is actually being used at the moment. Um, what's your opinion of TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy, um, that somebody has been receiving? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a quick comment on that. Um, uh, I think um, the TMS and also the, the, the um, sort of non-invasive stimulation techniques um, that we've touched on a bit here, um, these are, are very uh, powerful techniques, but we really don't know that much about how they work. 
And so the biophysics of the whole thing is, is a, a big unknown, which is unfortunate because then um, translating that to treatment um, makes it really hard. And we know there have been a number of TMS trials um, that have shown maybe slightly above placebo uh, effectiveness. Um, and um, that might owe in large part to the fact that the specificity of, of the um, stimulation and the target of stimulation um, were not the most effective, um, assuming that, that that method would would be effective at all in the first place. Um, so the uh, work that we're doing here um, is to use a TMS on, on people, on these same epilepsy patients that are implanted with electrodes invasively to understand exactly, as, or as well as we can, what's happening when you stimulate non-invasively um, and, and what's happening to the current that's passed through the brain. Um, a lot of TMS research as well um, has started by, by using a target that I would say is reasonably unwise and, and, and not the smartest choice. And that was the um, sort of happenstance target that was used for depression treatment, which is used um, effectively, reasonably effectively, um, for uh, medically refractory depression. And that's the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so people thought, well, why don't we just aim the TMS coil there and just see what it does for tin tinnitus? But as we all also know, that, that uh, depression and anxiety are largely comorbid with tinnitus in many cases. So you might have been treating the comorbid depression and people were just reporting their slight improvements with that. So it was not actually a treatment of tinnitus per se, right? Um, and I, I really hear the, the call and direction for research that, that, uh, that Hazel was mentioning about, and, and we've talked about today, um, that um, research, uh, and, and it is beginning to really starting to look at the changing the perception of tinnitus and, and hearing the sound as it were, as opposed to treating um, the comorbid um, uh, anxiety and depression and things like this, which is exactly what a TMS target to left DLPFC is doing. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's missing the right target is what I'm saying. Um, that being said, uh, I haven't yet been clever enough to find the right target. I've tried, uh, believe me, I have actually tried, um, and and it met with some mixed success. Um, but I, but I'm I'm interested in continuing, and, and I think people are aware that there are TMS trials for tinnitus as well. Um, uh, so, sorry, yeah, I think that's that's all. I'll no, say. that's great. Thanks for that that very comprehensive answer. I think David just wants to come in with a point. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what the questioner's um, experience of TMS has been. Um, but just purely looking at the research literature, it's something that we were quite critical of in the Wise and No Cure for Tinnitus paper, because there are lots of trials on TMS, but there's nothing particularly um, out there that really looks to answer the question. There's a lot of quite small studies, not necessarily you know, particularly well designed, either single case study or not randomised or not controlled. So there's lots of little studies out there and it's something that regularly plagues the tinnitus literature is this so lots of small things but nothing comprehensive that really looks to put together a, a robust trial that would you know strongly answer the question that's something that we're really you know looking for and i think would help us really move forward with our knowledge on tms is that well-designed robust trial with good numbers that can you know comprehensively answer it one way or the other I'll just I'll just pick up on that. I wanted to comment earlier, David. I completely agree. No, I really do. Um, which is why I haven't published on my one subject with with TMS. Um, uh, but that trial with the oxytocin, uh, I, I'll admit I didn't know. I wasn't aware of it because it looks like it's maybe just starting now. Um, uh, but thirty participants is woefully low. Um, and uh, 15 in each arm of a crossover study. It, it, that's a nice design, but 30 is, 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 is really going to stretch the, the design of, of uh, the, your ability to detect something. Um, and, and maybe they all only intended it to be a small initial study. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think um, as Deb Hall has been pushing and, and David is aware of and, and has pushed in, in, that, in that paper as well, that tinnitus researchers really need to be pushing more robust research, even at the initial stages, um, to really start reporting reporting things. Uh, Completely yeah. agree. Yeah, just want to say. <laughs> uh, 
Well, thank you very much for that. I think we've uh, really been quite so long on TMS. Um, there's a question here, right? It seems to be um, sticking up for poor world subjective measurement of tinnitus. We've talked a lot about objective measurement of tinnitus. So are there actually any benefits to having a subjective measurement of the level of tinnitus? Right. There's a bit of silence happening. I don't think anybody's happy to wanting to take this on. So I'm wondering if that's a no, if anybody in the I'm oh, sorry, could you say the question again? Which one was it? Yep. Yeah. Are there any benefits to having a subjective measurement of the level of tinnitus? Yes. That's a very definite yes. <laughs> uh, well, it's simple to, um, you know, to distribute. It's something that people can interact with. You can see a very quick answer. I think for clinical work, yeah, a, a subjective measure may be, you know, as good as it gets. I think you know, like I said, for those research trials, you want something probably a little bit more robust. But, but I still think there's value in being able to say to someone, yeah, you know, let's do this questionnaire. And actually, yeah, you're right. You know, you do have it really bad. And, you know, let's look at, at what we can do. Or, you know, giving someone a score and, and looking at how to interact and take it forward. I think there is real value in that. You know, you can still argue about whether the um, subjective measures we have are, you know, the best subjective measures we can come up with. Um, but yeah, I, I still think there's there's value in it. Ralph, um, you'd like to yeah. make it? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah, so I definitely agree with David. You know, with subjective um, measurements are useful as well because because ultimately what what we want to do is link those objective you know um, measures up with subject with um, subjective measures because ultimately you know. Um, we need to understand what a treatment needs to do to someone's um, everyday life with, with tinnitus, and, and that's going to be a subjective thing. Um, and then we need to relate that to something that can be kind of measured in, in, in the lab. So, so we, we need both. Well, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question, I guess, is a, is a question that is um, on the forefront of most of our minds at the moment because it's about COVID. It says, could existing tinnitus be made much worse um, by COVID? And is there an argument to be made that those with tinnitus should be prioritised for vaccine? Well, I'll start by saying I'm unaware of a, a link so far. Um, uh, I've, I've yet to hear about a link. Um, Although we have not necessarily, I, I personally have not gone and look, looked for that uh, uh, or asked that question. Um, so that might be something that, that could be easily done. Um, but in terms of priority, uh, that's, uh, that's difficult to say, I think. Um, and um, there are a lot of other um, groups that would want their, their particular uh, condition to be prioritized uh, in as well in addition to, to uh, uh, tinnitus. Um, okay, Ralph. Uh, Ralph. Uh... Yeah, yeah, so yes, I think, I think it's hard, hard to kind of make, make the case to prioritise it at the moment. But actually, we, we're just, our, our idea is just about to start funding some research in Manchester, actually um, looking at auditory function in people who have had COVID-19. So, so over the coming months, um, we'll begin to understand the, the relationship, if there is one. Um, but I think it's a bit too soon to kind of be able to make that um, argument. Excellent. And uh, this question is actually addressed to Phil. Um, do you think there's a genetic link that fits into the inflammatory scenario that you mentioned? Yeah, so that's that's a, a, a clever question because I think implicit in that comment would be the expectation that there would be some genetic link. And I think the uh, one of the things actually that came out of the um, uh, the sort of information session that we had with the, uh, the PTA and the ATA um, at the uh, ARO conference in early 2020 was was a nice presentation. Um, about some of the connections uh, that seem to be being shown um, uh, in a genetic fashion with tinnitus. 
And I, I think this is exciting directions for research. Um, and uh, it, it just needs to move forward more, basically. And and all of the one one of the discussion points was was about big data, and and in terms of uh, biobanks have been mentioned here as well. And and these are going to enable um, really help uh, the genetic front in terms of uh, finding links for for um, tinnitus specifically. But as I mentioned before, in terms of hearing loss, um, this the hearing loss end of things uh, has has moved a little bit further on than, than tinnitus so far, um, but I, I think there's promising directions for that in, in the future. And and how that would dovetail then with, specifically with an inflammatory pathway, I think is is definitely up for grabs, um, an interesting direction. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, if there's anything else to add to this, but a follow-up question to that was, there has there been any genetic data collected and compared for similarities. And the question in particular was asked about celiac disease research, which has identified genetic markers more as a, a predisposition than a certainty. And I imagine that's an inflammatory condition as well. Yes, and, and uh, I'm not aware of, of uh, anything as of yet. And I would think that the uh, it might simply, again, just be a question of numbers in terms of the numbers of people that, that also have tinnitus and celiac disease. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not aware of, of a particular prevalence of, of the comorbidity of these things. Um, but uh, I think it's it, the reason why I'm reach, <laughs> struggling for words is because the genetic links is, re is really in the early days. And then I'm, there's not that much research that's out there um, as of yet, but it, it's, it's starting. Um, um. We're moving towards the end of the evening, but we've probably got time for a few more um, questions. So I'll ask this one quickly, and it's um, targeted at, at, at David, actually. Um, does the BTA have any kind of relationship with drug companies who have been shown to be able to act quickly? And is there any pressure that can be applied? Um, so we do have relationships with um, drug companies and those who are interested or engaged in the tinnitus field and some who aren't yet, but we're trying to convince to become so. Um, and, you know, the feedback that we get is that they want that level playing field first. So so it's going to be hard for them to interact with tinnitus in a in a major way or invest heavily without an objective measure, without a reliable indicator of what happens between the animal work or the preclinical work and the clinical work. Um, you know, route to market in the US is another real challenge for uh, drugs companies in the tinnitus space because, you know, you would traditionally not necessarily have a route where you'd see someone who can prescribe a medication. So you at the US being a huge market, you know, is another challenge. So, so we know there are all these different challenges to unpick and we're working and, and supporting um, companies that are interested in the space to look at how we do that and how we did and how we respond to some of those challenges and I think that's why you see it um, shown so strongly in the in our organizations that are looking to, to fund research in terms of understanding these challenges and wanted to respond to them so that we can um, level that playing field if you want and open the doors to, to pharma to invest in it. Um, so I'd say you know Pharma companies I speak to are aware of tinnitus. They know the market size. You know, R and I do do a great job in producing sort of various reports to to assess the market size and, and really make the case for it. So I think you know they know that and they keep a watching brief. But at the same time, you know, they're aware of the challenges of of getting involved in tinnitus research as well. Um, so I don't necessarily know it's a it's a speed thing. It's more a you know, resolving some of those barriers or, you know, taking some of those barriers out of the way, I think, to, to companies getting involved. I and mean, again, Ralph's nodding and it's it's a field he interacts with more than me in a way as well. So it might be something yeah. he wants to input in. Yeah, I was just going to ask, you, you mentioned RNID, so I was just going to ask Ralph what, what his experience is with, with drug companies. Well, yeah, I mean, just, just to echo that, what David said, said is, you know, they... Um, they, they, they're all aware of the huge um, unmet need in the, in the huge market. Um, and it's really about, you know, waiting for the right kind of opportunity to come along. Mm -hmm. And I think organisations like ours, um, you know, can play a role in, in keeping them engaged, making sure they have sites of opportunities, connecting them up 
with the, with the right people so that they quickly you know get the answers that they that they need. So it sounds like it's still a case of keeping the conversations flowing and working with working with companies as and when we need it. We have another question that's kind of drug related, but this one is about um, psychedelic drugs. Um, one of our questioners says we can no longer ignore the potential of psychedelic drugs and they have a great result in depression removal. What do the panel think? I'll go first. I don't, I don't necessarily agree that it, that it has been ignored. It's something that is regularly looked at. I think, you know, we do look, you do see a lot of um, trials assessing different uh, drug compounds and some of them, you know, do um, sort of, you know, touch on um, uh, psychoanalytic drugs as well. Oh, I can't, sorry, I forgot the right uh, phrase, but um, the work of Grant Searchfield in New Zealand has, has done a number of trials looking at um, these sorts of drugs and how they interact with tinnitus as well. So, so I'd say some of that research is happening. Um, it's not really being picked up by, a, again, any of the, of the big companies at the moment, which I pro think probably tells you where it's got to so far. But it's, it's again, stuff that the, the field is aware of and, and interacts with at a, at a low level. And there are papers out there looking at uh, different um, drugs and how they might work and what the mechanism may be. <laughs> Okay, that's uh, that's great. We are running um, very close to our finishing time. So um, I'm sorry if we haven't actually got round to your question. We had a lot of questions as as always on these and we could only um, take a, a selection. I think this has been um, a fascinating discussion. There's plenty to come and um, I think there's a lot of to look forward to in the future. Now, before we all go, it would be great. Uh, Maisie's about to pop up um, a short poll, which is only two questions. There it is, I can see it on my screen. It would be really useful if you could just take a second to answer the questions because it helps in the development of our events. And while you're doing this, it just um, remains for me to thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry if we didn't answer them, like I said. Um, I'd like to thank Maisie for the behind the scenes of work that she's been doing, feeding me the questions, sorting out the tech, and of course she organised the whole thing and it's run beautifully smoothly, I feel. Um, and I'd also like to thank our panellists, David Stockdale, Hazel Goethart, um, Phil Gander, and Ralph Holm. And um, a recording of this webinar will be available soon and we'll send you all the details. Um, but before we finally close up, I'd just like to ask the panel if they've got any um, closing comments to leave us with. I think it's great to have things like this and the collaboration across all the different patient organisations involved. So yeah, thank you, Tina to Sub R and ID, American Tinnitus Association for you know, getting involved and helping with the organisation of this as well. Hopefully it's been of benefit to, to everyone on the call. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I think uh, there's opportunity for having more of these sorts of uh, discussions. I think uh, lots of good questions come out. I and, was and, uh, thinking the same, Philip, and especially the Q&A part, we should do more just just Q and A, maybe instead of broadcasting. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed it as well. So um, really, really, really interesting. Um, so thank, thank you for in, inviting me, and yeah, look forward to getting involved in more of these things. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, uh, very much, and I hope you can. Um, have a good evening and perhaps join us at a future event. Thanks.